Uh, hello, Sewaru and Namaste. This is Maruhang Kowahang. I am co-host for the Global Network YouTube channel. In today's uh, episode, uh, I have Professor uh, Stock Source. Mm -hmm. I have invited him and he happily agreed it. <laughs> and today we are going to talk about digital collaborative learning. Uh, Stocks, welcome to our program. Thank you for having me, Marlon. Yeah, it's our pleasure to have you today. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, yes, I'll try to say a few short words about that. Uh, here at Michigan State University, I teach in the Center for Integrative Studies in the Arts and Humanities, mm -hmm. uh, which is really just a big fancy way of saying general, general education. Uh -huh. Uh, and so uh, this, this idea of digital collaborative learning really started to take firmer shape uh, during the two pandemic years from uh, 2020 through th the fall of 2020 through mm. the spring of 2022, so four semesters. Uh, and and uh, of course, at that time, many of us were teaching uh, remotely. Mm -hmm. uh, I was teaching my courses uh, in an online asynchronous mm -hmm. uh, modality. And uh, even though prior to the pandemic, um, I had my students doing collaborative activities and mm -hmm. in a limited way using digital tools to do that. Mm -hmm the pandemic and retooling my courses for <clears throat> pardon me for two years mm -hmm. of teaching asynchronously um i sort of went much more in the direction of digital collaborative learning uh trying to make my courses more engaging and uh, to get my students who after all are non-majors these are general education courses after all to help my students become more interested in and more fully engaged and invested in the 15 weeks of coursework mm -hmm. that I was asking them to complete. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, our audience from Nepal, mm -hmm. uh, India, Bhutan, mm -hmm. Hong Kong, uh, uh, let's say Thailand, mm -hmm. and USA, UK are watching also can, mm -hmm. are watching this interview. Mm -hmm. So like you mentioned digital collaborative learning yes so what is really collaborative learning because like we uh, talk a lot about digital technologies yes and we also talk about cloud technologies yes and we see like i see uh, my fellow himalayan activists mm -hmm. uh, community leaders scholars using technology a lot Mm -hmm. But when you use collaborative, mm -hmm. what does it mean? How collaborative mm -hmm. digital technology mm -hmm. kind of like functions in academia? Mm -hmm. At the same time, how it might function mm -hmm. like to network in popular cultures as well? Mm -hmm. All right, well, let me try to start with the first part of that. So, so the way I understand collaborative learning very simply is rather than students doing their work and and their their assessments their their mm -hmm. papers or whatever rather than having them complete that in isolation mm -hmm. they work together to yeah. discuss and examine and analyze course materials mm -hmm. each week mm -hmm. um, with the idea of sharing their experiences of those course materials, mm -hmm. their related ideas, and sort of, um, I've always thought of it as cross-pollination, <laughs> <laughs> like bees. Uh -huh. uh, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, the cross-pollination of ideas. Uh -huh. Our cross-pollination pedagogy. Yes, uh -huh. exactly. Uh, and, and they are sort of working together, mm -hmm. again, to reiterate, they are working together to explore and develop ideas around whatever course materials I am asking them to, to uh, watch or mm -hmm. read and mm -hmm. think about uh, each week mm -hmm. of the course. And similarly, uh, I ask my students to um, complete three collaborative projects mm -hmm. at roughly uh, the first second and final third of mm -hmm. the semester, because we have 15-week semesters right. here at Michigan State, right. 
uh, they are also developing and creating and sharing those projects mm -hmm. uh, in small collaborative teams, mm -hmm. typically of four and five students. Wow, so, so that's collaborative learning. To me, that's, mm -hmm. that's what collaborative learning means in a nutshell. Yeah, so you talked about like pollination also. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you literally explain that, how that <laughs> works, that, that functions in the classroom practices? Sure. Well, um, you know, and I will show my ignorance about insects here, but, but you know, <laughs> bees go out of the hive and they collect nectar and pollen oh, cool. gets on their bodies when, mm. they, when they go to various flowers to, to collect the nectar. And they, they take that pollen from flower to flower, mm -hmm. but also back to the hive. Right. Uh, it's you more know, like resource, like yeah, collecting, it, yeah, exactly, yeah, your pollen. Exactly. And, and you know, the, they, they sort of share that pollen. They share that nectar uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> with the hive. Yeah. And, and you know, if you, if you want to think of student learning teams of mm -hmm. four or five students as a hive, they all bring uh, different uh, strengths and mm -hmm. abilities, first of all, mm -hmm. to their team, uh, and they work with that team throughout the semester. Right. Um, they also, each week, bring different experiences of the course materials and also their different impressions right, and right. ideas about uh -huh. those courses. And if, if the team is actually doing things correctly, right. they share those ideas. And, and, and through those ideas and, and um, probing more deeply as mm -hmm. they ask each other questions mm -hmm. and follow-up questions even something as simple as i'm not sure exactly what you mean here yeah yeah could no, you no, say no, a little no, no, bit no. more no 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 that, that that's absolutely okay yeah that, that's what i wanted to know yes and i can kind of like anchor that to my research practices mm -hmm. and in my pedagogical practices too yes that's great and that's cross-pollination yeah. of that's ideas cross, yeah, yeah yeah that's so true cross-pollination yeah. pedagogy so in your collaborative mm -hmm. uh pedagogical mm -hmm. activities you send students out or yeah. you get them to do research in their communities yes. or cultures or in their group mm -hmm. and they bring uh, whatever kind of like ideas they get Mm -hmm. and kind of like work together in a group. Yes. And they don't have to be uh, physically together, right? It, it's, it's done like digitally in the cloud. Well, th that's correct. Now, since we are now more or less face-to-face, -face, and I'm teaching my classes, my courses as hybrid courses, uh, I do meet with my students once a week now uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, on Mondays, uh, but, but uh, that's just 25% of the course. 75% okay. of the course... Mm -hmm. Uh, they are working outside of Monday meetings with their student learning mm -hmm. teams from week three, and, right. and that's coming up next week. Uh, and they can do that face-to-face, -face, but some of that communication and exchange of ideas, mm -hmm. no doubt, will be done using digital and cloud-based tools, whether that is something as simple as email or texting, um, or whether it's using a conferencing app like Zoom or Microsoft Teams, or whether that is uploading materials to a, a Google Drive that the team creates mm -hmm. with folders in that Google Drive where they can share and contribute to and revise um, project materials as, as they are developing their work uh, in advance of the Week 5 project or the Week 10 project or the Week 14. Uh, project, projects sounds, one, two, and yeah, three. Yeah, sounds sounds very interesting, uh, Professor Stocks. Sure. <laughs> okay, now, uh, so, uh, like folks okay, from South Asia, yes. especially, mm -hmm. or from around the world, also watching this interview. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a uh, hybrid course, okay? Yes. So, what does that mean, and how does it work? Okay, especially. I'm focusing this one because now, like South Asian, especially from like academic culture, mm -hmm. professors, administrators, mm -hmm. and including cultural activists who want to kind of like change traditional pedagogy mm -hmm. might get benefited from this conversation. Sure. So yeah, w w what is hybrid? All right. Well, to the best of my understanding, a, a hybrid course is where 
there is some face-to-face -face contact between mm -hmm. the instructor and and the students uh, here at Michigan State. That that's once a week. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I happen to see my students on Monday, but mm -hmm. other professors might do it differently. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's it's a, a 25 percent uh, face to face contact. Mm -hmm. 75 percent of their work they they complete they carry out mm -hmm. uh, on their own outside of class. Mm -hmm. And given the collaborative nature of my courses and the collaborative design, that is up to each student learning team to determine how best they wish to do that. There is no one single way. Mm -hmm. I, I provide guidance. Right, right. Uh, I provide a lot of support within our learning management system mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. here at Michigan State University. That's D2L or Desire to Learn <laughs> uh, is okay. the long name. Right. Um, but they take that information and they decide in their team of four or five Okay, uh, you know, one, one team might actually decide they want to meet mm -hmm. Thursday evenings face to face in the library. Another team might decide, well, let's meet via Microsoft Teams mm -hmm. uh, once a week on Saturday mornings mm -hmm. and take care of our discussion and analysis of course materials for the next week mm -hmm. so that everyone can then go away and do their small individual. Uh, reflection and self-assessment of their learning and then turn that into the online submission folder mm -hmm. on D2L. Okay. It's, 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 uh, that's how I understand hybrid learning. It's a, it's a blend. Some people call it blended learning. Right. It's a mix of face-to-face -face contact with uh, work outside of that face-to-face -face contact versus mm -hmm. traditional meetings where you might see your students in a classroom two or three days a week or online teaching, mm -hmm. whether synchronously where you actually see them in real time mm -hmm. or asynchronously where, you know, they have access to all of the course materials online, mm -hmm. but you don't actually have real time contact. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier, just you mentioned like you get your students to what? I mean, definitely like video. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And read. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, you know, my focus is uh, especially South Asian uh, academic culture. Okay? Yes. Uh, we tend to, or they tend to use kind of like already ready-made type of syllabi. Mm -hmm. And they are not allowed to pick any reading materials. Mm. And even like watch videos. Mm -hmm. I believe so because I frequently talk to my friends and who are professor in Nepal mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, even in uh, India, Sikkim. Mm -hmm. So how do you design syllabi or mm -hmm. syllabus? Mm -hmm. And how do you incorporate reading materials, mm -hmm. including videos mm -hmm. and other stuff in your design? Are you free to do it? Or yeah. you are given kind of like ready-made ready syllabus or mm -hmm. syllabi? Uh, we are, at least for right now, we are pretty free to design a course and set up our course and the related syllabi, mm -hmm. syllabus for, mm -hmm. for a singular mm -hmm. course, uh, in, in any way we see fit. This is, of course, in keeping with this idea of academic freedom, mm -hmm. uh, more or less, that we have here uh, in, in U.S. society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that's my answer to the first part of your question. Right. Uh, secondly, as far as the course design, uh, we have a 15-week semester here at Michigan State University. And so for the online portion of that, um, I break that down into 15 um, weekly course modules mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on D2L or Desire to Learn. Right. Uh, and within each one of those modules, um, I try to lay out exactly what students need to watch mm -hmm. in the case of my film courses, mm -hmm. uh, what they need to read, because I always try to include a, a range of um, supporting uh, journal article PDF files mm -hmm. and I give my students the option you know you can pick one of those to read yeah. you don't have to read all of them mm -hmm. but you know pick one mm -hmm. um, and then sort of I, I provide uh, fairly detailed and clear instructions of what they need to do after that uh, which most weeks includes <coughs> meeting with their student learning team mm -hmm 
where they discuss and analyze what they have watched and what they have read. They try to connect what they have read with what they have watched mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in my film courses or with what they have read if it's a course that um, has novels or mm -hmm. plays as, as the primary focus mm -hmm. because I, I do teach courses where, with novels and plays rather oh. instead of films. Right. Um, and, and then after they do that work, that discussion with their student learning team, then each student most weeks uh, needs to create a brief reflection on and self-assessment of their learning in mm -hmm. the course for that week. Mm -hmm. And they ha again have a choice of how they create that reflection. They can write a 700 to 900 word traditional essay right. if they want. Uh -huh. If they would prefer to record a short video with their phone mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. upload that to the submission folder on D2L, they can do that too. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, if they prefer to record podcast audio, mm -hmm. again, just their voice mm -hmm. for five or six minutes and upload that audio file, okay. they can do that too. Or um, they can create a, a seven to nine hundred word blog post. Mm -hmm. They can create a, a blog that they that they develop during the semester. Okay. So there there are uh, students have options basically mm -hmm. in what they watch or what they read, the supporting scholarship that they choose to read, and then also um, how they sort of share their thinking about and their learning about those course materials after they meet and discuss those materials with their student learning team. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. You're welcome. So uh, I would like to ask if since, like uh, I always say, that mm -hmm. our folks from South Asia, mm -hmm. okay, where uh, they barely use technologies, okay? mm -hmm. uh, but I think because I constantly com communicate with them and though uh, they, their kind of modality was mm -hmm like an asynchronous, maybe like synchronous, uh, it was not hybrid, okay. Mm -hmm. So they, they know technology a little bit, mm -hmm. I believe, or maybe more also. What kind of technologies you use mm -hmm. in your hybrid class, mm -hmm. in your face-to-face, in-person mm -hmm. uh, uh, classes, mm -hmm. including your online, absolutely online, mm -hmm. or let's say asynchronous, uh, classes. What kind of technologies okay. you use? Well, let me talk about the hybrid mm -hmm. uh, part first. Um, when I meet my students face to face, and and this was true when I was teaching um, fully face to face courses twi that met twice a week before the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, I would use PowerPoint. Oh, cool! Uh, PowerPoint slides um, where I would project project. Um, the sort of agenda for the day, mm -hmm. what we would discuss, and then have additional slides with various kinds of activities that I would have student pairs or small groups doing before the class then reconvened as a large group, mm -hmm. and we discussed their, their ideas or their findings. Depending on what I yeah. asked them, to because like you send them like bees, like to collect <laughs> pollen. You know, yeah, and I might say, okay, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. get get into trios, count right, off right. by threes, or turn to the person next uh -huh. to you, or uh, count off by fives, mm -hmm. or um, you know, maybe I might write down on the chalkboard up at the mm -hmm. front of the room or the whiteboard now because mm -hmm. we don't really have chalkboards yeah, much anymore. anymore. Uh -huh. um, but I would say, all right, uh, we have. Um, five kinds of dessert, you know, uh, ice cream, uh, fresh fruit, cookies, chocolate, um, you know, and something else. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, which one of those is your favorite? And I'd give the students a moment to think, and then I would say, okay, find four other people who share that same favorite dessert. Wow, cool. And the idea is, of course, to form groups of four or five students. <laughs> now, sometimes oh. that would take a little long. Yeah, that's uh, how you create groups. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but, but anyway, once they move around and get into their groups, and I would always tell them, you know, take writing materials or your laptops or your, or your tablets, because a lot of students use uh, styluses uh, on tablets now. Mm -hmm. Um, then I would sort of on the PowerPoint uh, up at the front of the room, I would project the task. 
uh -huh. that I needed them to carry out over the next, let's say, five to ten minutes. And then I would say, okay, you know, here you go. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to be thinking about. Uh, go to it. Mm -hmm. And I would circulate around the room to answer any questions they might have. Mm -hmm. I still do this with my hybrid courses that meet once a week. Um, for, for the times that those hybrid courses uh, are outside of class during the rest of the week or mm -hmm. when I was teaching asynchronously online during the two pandemic years, uh, there is an awful lot that students uh, have access to through our learning management system mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. at Michigan State. Right. Again, that's D2L. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a lot of things uploaded there, whether those are uh, files created in Microsoft Word mm -hmm. or PowerPoint files, uh -huh. or whether those are hyperlinks to digital sources on YouTube or mm -hmm. elsewhere right. online. Students, of course, are using their own technologies, whether mm -hmm. that is laptops or tablets or very often their phones, uh, to access those materials on D2L. Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to the creation of their uh, collaborative projects, their mm -hmm. three collaborative projects, right. uh, they are also using all kinds of apps uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, to create those projects. That could be something like Google Slides. Uh, it could be um, something that they create through the Canva app, mm -hmm. you know, some kind yeah, of poster yeah. uh -huh, uh -huh. or um, an infographic Wow. Uh, or, or something like that. It could be a video that they create using mm -hmm. their phones mm -hmm. or maybe using the Wii Video app. Wow. Uh, it, I mean, there are, so a there lot are of lots of different kinds of things. Yeah, right. Uh, some of it is up to students. You know, I, I offer sort of general suggestions, but mm -hmm. ultimately it's up to the students or the student teams to decide what uh, technologies they are going to use to carry out a particular task mm -hmm. or develop a particular project. Right, okay. So while, since both of us are like professors, mm -hmm. Uh, when like we teach, mm -hmm. like we al always kind of like think about making our understand, uh, making our students mm -hmm. meet goal, or we collectively, mm -hmm. instructors or professors and students mm -hmm. kind of like collectively mm -hmm. meet the goals, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, for instance, you know, in the past also, like I'm talking about the traditional way of teaching, mm -hmm and now multimodal teaching mm -hmm. or digital based or cloud based or cloud and cloud based teaching that you and I both say that okay mm -hmm. how do you compare this paper based or traditional mm -hmm. pedagogical approaches <laughs> <laughs> and now modern pedagogical mm -hmm. approaches that yeah. uh, you and I say that it's a modern yeah. but many people may not like people I mean, especially mm -hmm. instructors mm -hmm. professors even administrators are not providing them, maybe okay. Mm -hmm. But like, I want you to talk mm -hmm. to uh -huh. uh, like administrators, mm -hmm. including government mm -hmm. and professors, yeah. or the teachers and all. Which one is better? Well, I, I don't know that, that one is better than the other, but what I can say is, is two things. Mm -hmm. One, we are now well into the third decade of the 21st century, and so. digital and cloud-based technologies mm -hmm. in many areas of the world are pervasive. Right. They're all around us. Yeah. Um, we, can't, I, we can't ignore. No, you can't <laughs> ignore this. And I no would, teachers ignore, students yeah. can't ignore that, right? No. Yeah. And, and, and I've never been to Asia, but I would be willing to bet that in the larger cities, the major metropolitan mm. areas mm. in Asia, whether that's Japan or China or Taiwan mm. or, or, or South Asia, yeah. uh, you know, India, Nepal, Sri mm. Lanka. Including Bhutan, let's say. Exactly. Mm -hmm. In larger cities, digital technologies and access to these technologies, particularly among the younger generations, is pervasive. Everyone has some kind of phone, whether mm -hmm. it's an iPhone or something similar. Mm -hmm. Everyone is always on their phone. They are on social media. Um, you know, they use email, although 
here yeah. in the United States, even email is considered kind of old-fashioned. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, it's it's all uh, it, it's all Twitter, or I think they call uh -huh. it X now. Uh -huh. it's, it's no lie. It's formerly Twitter. I, uh -huh. I, I, you know, Instagram, all of these sorts of things. Uh, Meta, or or what used to be called Facebook. Uh -huh. It's pervasive. It is it is the way things are going, and and while to academics the written word is still very relevant and it's how we think it's how we share our thinking and our research and how we interact with the rest of the world and mm -hmm. certainly each other that is not how this younger generation uh, you know generation Z or generation alpha even uh -huh. you know my son is almost 14 and I believe he is generation alpha uh -huh. Traditional written work is not how they see and interact with the world. Right. And many students of uh, in their teenage years or their early 20s see writing traditional essays, mm -hmm. I'm afraid, as hopelessly outdated. Now, I know a lot of people <laughs> around the world, academics, yeah. administrators, and maybe uh, some students mm -hmm. might disagree vehemently right, right. with that. Uh -huh. But my impression is that many more see it as an outdated thing, and it's not something that they are particularly strong at. They communicate in much shorter digital bursts, these tweets. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so digital technology and, and my gradual move towards using more digital technologies is is an attempt to more effectively engage my students in my courses right. and and make it more interesting uh -huh. to them uh -huh. many of my students while they might have trouble with traditional written texts are nevertheless very creative and so by bringing in all kinds of digital and cloud-based creative tools, let's call them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, this is an attempt to give my students a chance to create and share their learning in new and more interesting ways than the traditional type of quiz or exam or research paper. Because uh, effectively documenting your sources, whether those are traditional print sources mm -hmm. or digital sources, is a hallmark of effective uh, scholarly practice, mm -hmm. as, as you always say, I, I mm -hmm. use those words in my in my assignment. Oh, prompts. thank you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you put uh -huh. it very well. Um, so, so I would say, and I, I hope I'm not straying too far from your original question. Um, I'm I'm trying to make what I do more interesting and engaging and relevant to students in their late teens and early 20s in the third decade of the 21st century. Yeah, yeah. And this is, this is the way the world is going. And, and um, you know, there is the, the case of the digital d divide. And, mm -hmm. you know, it might not be as far along elsewhere in the world as it is in North America and Europe, uh, right. but uh, uh, these things are increasingly cheap and mm -hmm. I think sooner or later even people in remote areas, right. if they are not already mm -hmm. uh, online with access to these, these, these sources in one way, they will very shortly have mm -hmm. access to these kinds of technologies. Right. And, and I, I think it's foolish of us as instructors, whether that is K through 12 or whether that is higher education, mm -hmm. I, I think it's foolish to turn a blind eye to these things and pretend like they aren't, <laughs> like they aren't out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very similar to uh, generative artificial intelligence, That's AI. So true. That's so true. It's, it's foolish of us to pretend like our students are not going to use this stuff. Yeah. We need to know how to harness it and use it to our advantage while, and say to our students, okay, this, this tool is out there, you can use it, but you need to be mindful of mm -hmm. these, these certain things, and if you use it, you need to document that.
flat, flat. again, yeah, yeah, <laughs> as, as yeah. part of your work cited uh -huh. or your references that, or your bibliography yeah, yeah. page. Because that source comes from somewhere, right? It comes from somewhere. Right, even, right. even if you use that source mm -hmm. as a way to sort of help your jumpstart your thinking at the beginning of an assignment. Uh, the world is drastically project. changing. Very quickly. Very quickly. I mean, it might have quickly. been different even 20 years ago. Uh, right. Absolutely. In, in even like 10 2000s. years ago. Even, even in 10, 10 years, years ago. ago. Even 10 years ago. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you a little personal story. Uh, when I started my PhD program uh, in 2000 mm -hmm. at the University of Minnesota, um, I was uh, that first semester that I was teaching, uh, we were required to take a teaching and learning seminar mm -hmm. in which they taught us how to teach. Right. Uh, and part of that seminar, we met twice a week and there was a lot we had to do. It was, it was very busy. Um, but part of that seminar, we were taught how to use, um, at that time, various kinds of cutting, a, cutting edge digital and cloud-based technologies. Uh -huh. and, and the internet was still kind of a new thing in, yeah. in 2000. Right. And I remember thinking to myself and saying to my fellow graduate students at the time, <laughs> oh, you know, I'm never going to use this. I can't see a time when I'll ever use this. And, you know, very quickly, though, yeah. I started incorporating some of this into the course that I was also teaching my students. Uh, I was teaching an introductory uh, language course, uh -huh. uh, Introductory uh -huh. Norwegian 1001 yeah. and wow. 1002. Uh -huh. I met my students five days a week. Fantastic. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. But I found uh -huh. very quickly during that first uh -huh. semester, even though I had thought otherwise, I was starting to use some digital technologies. So this has kind of been a gradual process that has happened in my own teaching. Mm -hmm without my even realizing it at times over the last uh, 20 plus years. And, and to reiterate what I said a few moments ago, I, I think it's foolish on our part to mm -hmm. pretend like this, this transition is not happening. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we need to be part of it so that we as educators are not left in the 20th century. <laughs> right, that's so true, yeah, yeah. So finally, this is my final question. Yes. Uh, yeah, so stocks, you know, mm -hmm. once you mention digital divide, yes, I want to again, I want you mm -hmm. to talk to yeah. our different governments uh -huh. and administrators, yeah. professors, yeah. and teachers, yeah. including cultural activists and uh -huh. community leaders, okay? Yeah. Why the, why the concept, the phrase you used? Di di digital divide is really important. Well, it, it, it gets back to this idea of democratizing learning and mm -hmm. democratizing knowledge, I think. Yeah. And, and again, I'm not an expert on this, but just mm -hmm. off the top of my head to answer your question, it, it's this idea of, of democratizing mm -hmm. learning and, and knowledge. And Without governments and also at, at, the, at the national and regional and local levels and mm -hmm. then also educational administrators, mm -hmm. again, whether you're talking um, uh, primary schools mm -hmm. and, yeah. and high schools mm -hmm. as well as colleges and universities, wow. Um, so that young people are not left behind. That's so true. Because you just mentioned mm -hmm. AI. Yes. How we are combating, okay, with yes. the AI. Yeah. Yeah, we, we believe or we cannot have one notion mm -hmm. of use of AI technologies mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And in the developed countries, mm -hmm. like students yeah. or the people are using or they're growing together with the AI technologies. Yeah. Whereas in the develop, and I don't say developing mm -hmm. countries, like I hate mm -hmm. to use that, but mm -hmm. in some Countries, communities, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. uh, even like, you know, let's say in a region, mm -hmm. they tend to ignore. Well, I, and, and so we, and I think we can also in, in the global north, and, mm -hmm. and I hope that phrase yeah. is still correct. Mm -hmm. uh, we can. Somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> it, may not, it may not work in a Siberia. No. <laughs> but, but, you know. Or I, somewhere I, elsewhere. I, I, mm -hmm. I know that f first world and third world are mm -hmm. not 
the preferred terms anymore. Yeah, and and yeah. I know that developed world and developing world are not, for some people, the preferred terms. Right. I, I think, at, at least until fairly recently, Global North and Global mm -hmm. South were more preferred. It, it's difficult to keep up with these changes in, in, in terminology. But, but I think even in, uh, let's say, North America and, mm -hmm. and Europe and certain other highly developed societies, we can work to advocate for and help those less developed areas of mm -hmm. the world to, to, educationally speaking, help get institutions of learning up to speed with this with access to mm -hmm. all of the affordances of digital and cloud-based technologies mm -hmm. and tools to close this digital gap and i hope this is not too utopian a view but to close this this digital divide this gap and and democratize learning and democratize the creation and sharing of knowledge more effectively than we have managed to do so up mm -hmm. until this this point i mean the, the and and people have been saying experts have been saying for a long long time whether they are um political scientists or people in national governments or people in the corporate world or people in education who think on a global scale, mm -hmm. the world has been getting smaller and smaller and smaller for a long, long time. I mean, yeah. for the second half of the 20th century, really. That's true. That's true. Once we mm -hmm. entered the jet age after mm -hmm. the end of the Second World War mm -hmm. and the space age and satellite communications mm -hmm. and then of course the internet exploded in the 1990s uh -huh. and it has only accelerated since the 21st century 23 almost 24 years ago mm -hmm. and it's not going away and and it always amazes me the number of people who pretend like it's going away or that we <laughs> can ignore this uh -huh. And I would say it's not a matter of combating this. It's yeah. a matter of working with the situation we are presented with. Right. Right. Working, working effectively with uh -huh. and trying as educators to ensure that not only are we helping our students who are uh -huh. actually in the room with us uh -huh. here in East Lansing, Michigan at Michigan State, State University, University. Mm -hmm. but also advocating on a broader scale uh, across the United States and across the globe. That's true. That's so uh, true. Okay. You know, in, in our own uh -huh. small way to again try to democratize all of this more effectively. And, and I, I hope that doesn't sound impossibly idealistic. Mm -hmm. But, but I, and I hope I have not strayed too far from your question. But, no, no, but, you, you are on the track. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 to, to, to uh -huh. To my mind, that's, yeah. that's what we need to do. We, we should be doing more than simply what we do when we meet our students in a classroom or online once or twice mm -hmm. a week, mm -hmm. or when we answer an email when they have asked us a question via email. Yeah, that, so. that's true. Right. And at the same time, I was thinking about people and our students who live in the remote area, mm -hmm. even the, uh, the governments tend to ignore like science and technology or yeah. internet-based learning, uh, learning, let's say, okay. Mm -hmm. So definitely the way people understand digital technology mm -hmm. is not only about like being put and regional, mm -hmm. but be, though they have digital technologies, mm -hmm. many folks, mm -hmm. when I say folks, you know, mm -hmm. folks who, who are like uh, political leaders, mm -hmm. that mean governments, mm -hmm. professors, Mm -hmm. teachers mm -hmm. and and cultural activists the reason I say is you know mm -hmm. in South Asia it's only the activist okay mm -hmm. community leaders mm -hmm. they are shaping their local communities local schools okay yeah so will they be able to kind of like prepare mm -hmm. students mm -hmm. or next generation global citizens let's yes. say Yes. You know, who can equally contribute to the development of the, their, their, their own local community, 
Yeah. Regional communities? Yes. Or global communities? Global okay. society. Uh, global society? Yes. Let's say, okay. Yes. And your and, term yeah. next generation yeah. Is, yeah. is excellent. You know, change is constant. Mm -hmm. and, and in order for people to become, uh, you know, to acquire next generation skills, some authors call these 21st century skills, right, right. they have to be presented with the opportunity to cultivate right. these right. skills. Yeah. And it has not been for a, a number of years now, maybe even two or three decades, it has not been just being able to read well and write papers, <laughs> excuse me, write yeah. papers or do well on quizzes and exams. Yeah. Uh, the students need to be able to acquire other kinds of skills. Yeah. That and even you and I do not know? The, correct. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we can't imagine. Uh, yeah. you know, we, yeah. we have no mm -hmm. way of knowing what's 10 years down yeah. the road, yeah. but yeah. we can equip our students whatever we have now yes to okay. be more intellectually flexible mm -hmm. so that they can better pivot and there's mm -hmm. a, a word from 2020 <laughs> that you never wanted to hear again yeah, uh, yeah. we can equip them to more effectively pivot to whatever new challenges and opportunities mm -hmm. might come along in five or ten or twenty years right. in a way that much more traditional pedagogical mm -hmm. methods do mm -hmm. not yeah. And, you know, lecturing where the professor or the teacher is the only one speaking and everybody else is taking notes or sleeping for an hour at a time, that might have been effective in 1950, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for some. Yeah. And, and I'm not completely dismissing lecturing. I mm -hmm. think it still has its place. But, but for most 21st century students, that is not an effective way to to deliver information and it is not an effective way to help them acquire and cultivate these next generation mm -hmm. or 21st century skills thank you thank and you finally we are ending this <laughs> very very encouraging right and alarming as well because some people are ignoring Yes. Like the main message was embrace collaborative learning yes. and basically technology. Yes. A Don't, and advocate yeah. for it from the top down, from the governmental level on down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks for sharing your research based thoughts and ideas with the global uh, network audience. Thank you, Stocks. Well, thank you, Marahan.